first. Hi, everyone. This is the Myers fan, and I'm here with a friend of mine, Justin Beam. And you are from, is it Scream Factory? Like, where are you from again? Well, that's that's one of the things that I, one of the entities that I work with. Yeah, there. Scream Factory is a is a video distribution label, and I've been doing producing and directing and. Uh, things like that for them for a, a, a number of years now and a bunch of different titles so doing for them it's the same thing for anchor bay for arrow video uh, these other companies where i do mostly the supplementary material on blu-rays and dvds so like the documentaries new commentaries uh, behind the scenes featurettes interviews and stuff like that so that's what Is i there... do I'm sorry to interrupt. Is there a reason why they ask you to do commentary, or, or do you choose to do it? How does that work? Well, I usually don't like to appear in anything that I'm doing unless I'm asked to to do that. So I I don't ever plan to be a part of it. But for example, I mean, on on Halloween four and five commentaries years ago, those I had. I mean, I, it was me and. Dwight, so I brought Dwight Little in on part four, the director, and I got Don Shanks in on part five, who played Michael, of course, and so it they, it couldn't, it, in order to have the conversation flow, I, I served as essentially kind of a moderator, but really it was more of a conversation between the two of us. And so, so when it's structured like that, like on, there's a movie called Town That Dreaded Sundown, and for that one, I which is based on a true uh, actual case that that happened with these unsolved murders in Texas and when I did the commentary on that I brought in a an actual historian from down there to talk about the case itself and then I talked about the film side of things so on that one I served the purpose of the movie while he was speaking to the actual events which made for a really unique track so that was my choice to be a part of that one but just because of structurally it needed to to happen but in the in the case of like sleepaway camp for example uh, the day that we were going to record i had the two leads in the film felissa rose and jonathan tierston coming in and felissa asked if i would be on the track with her so what? yeah so for that one i'm there and i i don't serve as much of a purpose it's a little more of just the moderator to keep the conversation flowing when i did tank girl Lori petty asked that I be in the room with her, but I'm not on the track. So she hadn't done really any commentary stuff before. She's the star of Tank Girl, but she asked that I was in the booth with her while she was recording it. So I was there more as support in that case. And then on Body Bags, which is a John Carpenter and Toby Hooper film, um, these are just a few examples. On that one, Toby Hooper's segment is the third in the film. It's an anthology movie. And I had John Carpenter on the first two, which he directed. And I had set it up initially for Toby to do commentary on his segment, but at the last minute he backed out. So Wait I had... a minute, hold on. So you, I'm sorry, but you, I have to ask you this. You actually got John Carpenter to speak with you to do this commentary track with you? I've done a lot of stuff with John over the years. Yeah. Wow. From charity work to... I mean, the whole reason Body Bags ended up being re-released is because of conversations with me and him. And it's a movie that that had sort of been sitting on the shelf for many years after Showtime did a really poor release of it many years prior. And John wasn't really thrilled with what other companies were doing with his titles. And anyway, so, I mean, it was through conversations between the two of us that we ended up taking Body Bags to Shout Factory, Scream Factory, because is this is this via email or like how does that work when you when you ask someone? Uh, it email in person on the phone. It just depends. I mean, I've done, I've, I mean, the my relationship with John goes back quite a ways. I to back to doing some interviews with him years prior when I was writing for like Fangoria a lot. Famous Monsters of Filmland and a bunch of these other magazines. And so that's when I first became acquainted with him. And then I started working with Trankus and that intensified just because of, the, of us doing the Halloween stuff. And then uh, ma uh, my partner at Trankus and I, my ex-partner and I, we co-founded a, a nonprofit 
called the Scare Foundation, and we brought John in to be a member of the of the board. And so he and I had some work we did on that. And then I actually probably the the thing like I've I've always been such a an admirer of his work, obviously, but also um, I, I just really think that he until the last few years has been under celebrated. And a lot one of the things that I've done for him which I, you know, I wish I could do more, but a few years ago, I got the city of South Pasadena, which is really, could be considered Haddonfield, quote unquote, because, I know. yeah, and I got them to name, I worked with the city council and the mayor, and it took a, a while, but I got them to name uh, October 31st, John Carpenter Day in South Pasadena. So we got actually a holiday named after him in Haddonfield to celebrate him and so he he went and they had a whole ceremony where they presented him this document and it's in their city record and it was really cool way to celebrate him but ultimately all the things that I've done have been a celebration like in relation to him or a celebration of his work so yes to answer your question like on I've even shot interviews with him done commentary with him um, I produced some all the, these bonus materials that he's a part of as well. So we have a, a pretty long-standing relationship. I have to say, though, and I mean no offense, but I, I find it quite ironic that you say that uh, Mr. Carpenter is under-celebrated because I think he's one of the most iconic people in cinema, you know? So I really don't know what else they could do for him, you know? I think that that comes from... My perspective on that comes from years of people. Well, he has, he has always been, not always, he has long been revered in horror circles. But studios and in general film fans haven't, haven't given him, I guess, his due historically. He's considered a risk. He's never really made a huge movie. It's the same thing as someone like Toby Hooper or George Romero, where studios don't know what to do with these guys. We, we love them, and we understand and treasure their work, but the, the establishment doesn't really get them. And it honestly wasn't until Scream Factory started re-releasing a lot of John's movies, and then some of these, uh, or these music distribution labels started re-releasing his albums. And this is all within the last maybe five, six years or so. This has really been the resurgence and, and the real uh, uprising of an acknowledgement of what Carpenter, I think, has done for film and for music. And, that's, and, and also with the, the new synthwave movement in music, where there's a lot of these synth bands that are tipping their hat to him, acknowledging that he was the, the sort of point of origin for this, mu this whole subgenre of music. And that's his film scores. So I, I do think growing up, I, I wanted to see and hear more celebration of him. When The Thing came out, it, it completely sidetracked his career. I mean, the sci-fi purists hated it. The horror fans weren't immediate to embrace it at all. It was thought of as this freakish film that, was, that ruined the legacy of this iconic horror film. And it was because The Thing is a remake. And a lot of people yeah. felt about it like a lot of people feel about Rob Zombie's Halloween which is kind of ironic, but it, a lot of people look at it and go, at, at that time, they just didn't get it. So like many great things, it takes years for the general audience to open their arms and embrace it. And I think Carpenter has been that way. And I love that in the last 10 years, we have seen finally most, the or this greater acknowledgement of, of what he's contributed. Well, I just want to say, and I, I want to say this quickly, because for, first of all, this, interview is not about me it's it's about you and scream factory and halloween and all that stuff but i, I want to say quickly that uh, I, w I just want to clear up for the record um that i have nothing against him personally and i say that because a lot you know the audience is giving me a hard time and it's not like that i have a lot of respect for mr carpenter i've often paid tribute to him on the keyboard uh, playing his soundtrack like the the Myers House theme and the the main theme and the shape stalks and mm -hmm. if you go on my YouTube page you can 
hear a, a track of the shape stalks that's there it's not my best work but it's there so i i do have respect for mr carpenter i just you know disagree with some of his uh policies if you want to call them that but moving on i want to ask you what were your thoughts when the new halloween film was announced what, what were you thinking what were you feeling I, this, a new Halloween film has been in the works for so long now. I know. And, and it kept being, as you're well aware, as, yeah. you, as you have been charting through your, your videos and things, that it, it's been on the table, off the table, on the table, off the table. So honestly, when it was announced, I thought, I, and I think a lot of people probably felt this way, like, eh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if it's going to happen. But then when the, pieces started falling into place with Carpenter's association as producer for example like he doesn't jump into things that aren't legitimate so he's very choosy I think with what he's involved with and this uh, you know they wouldn't have just been able to throw that out there had it not been a concrete thing so that's when I thought okay now the wheels are actually moving on this thing maybe it's going to happen and with the announcement of Blumhouse being behind it instead of the the nightmare that is the Weinstein Company and Dimension Films. The, it, I think that as well. That was further. Um, it, it 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 further confirmed that this was actually going to be occurring because Blumhouse, you know, they put their they put action where a lot of people just throw words around and yeah. they they make things happen and they do it wisely like they're very conservative budget wise as you know their model is to spend little and really get them they maximize everything that they're spending and all these movies just this incredibly successful string of films that have done nothing but make a lot of money it makes sense for this franchise to be in their hands because they're passionate about horror and they get it and they know how to approach this honestly from probably by hollywood standards the closest approach to what Carpenter's original approach was financially and with what he was wanting to do with storytelling. So I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm intrigued about it. I, I don't know. What did you think when you first heard about it? Um, I was, I was very excited. And again, I want to thank you for, first of all, I want to thank you for being here. And I, I, I want to thank you for asking me because every time I have someone on here, they rarely ask me, what I think, and you are one of the only ones that, that ever do that. So again, thank you. Of course. To answer your question, however, I was really excited about it from about May of 2016, was it? Until about, I think, I think, I think it was February of, of 17, because then when they said that they brought Danny McBride in, I asked my cousin, I said, well, who's Danny McBride? He said, oh, that's a comedian. So, mm -hmm. That's when my stomach sort of turned. No offense to Danny if he's listening, but I got nervous because he said he was a comedian. So, and then when I heard that uh, that this was going to be like a reboot, that's when all hope was lost for me. I said, okay, this, you know, they're they're going back and they're erasing everything. So, essentially, this is Halloween too again. Yeah, it, one thing on to touch on the on the Danny McBride thing, it, it doesn't seem like an obvious choice, but when you think about it, you think about how many comedians have this dark side. Cause it's a tra yeah. it, it's a very tragic, a tragic profession to be in. And so many of them struggle with things like addiction and depression and their suicide is rampant among them. Like it's a really, it's a, it's a dark profession. And I think that in order to, get up on stage and do that and be willing to be the butt of jokes and make jokes and things. I think that that usually is born out of some sort of uh, something happening in your life where maybe you do understand isolation a little better than most people. And maybe you do understand um, the darker side of things. So it, it, while it doesn't seem immediately obvious that that's who they'd choose, I have every ounce of confidence that, that he could walk into that and, and have a great perspective. Because the other thing, too, is that it, we don't need someone who has come from decades of a horror background who may already have all these entrenched habits 
and things that they like to do with their storytelling. It's exciting to have someone there who this may be their first movement into the genre, but that comes at it with nothing but love and maybe a more organic understanding of darkness than what other people might just see as another job. Because there are a lot of directors out there who work as a job, and I'm not saying he doesn't. I don't know what his perspective is on making film. But if he's stepping into this realm, he understands it. And so I'm excited for it. And also, as you brought up the whole Halloween 2 thing, that's the part that's the most puzzling to me in this. I was honestly much more excited about this film until I, before I heard that Jamie Lee Curtis was going to be involved. Because mm -hmm. as much as I love her, and as do I, and she was associated with the nonprofit too. You know, she was a big part of our launch success years ago, and um, and so it, I have the utmost respect for her. I just don't understand the purpose of once again going back and ignoring all these films in the franchise and doing it in a way that they've already done before. They've already brought her in and ignored a bunch of entries in this film series and and picked up after the see uh, after part 2 with H2O. They've already brought her in and done this. So how different will this be? I don't know. That's where the mystery lies here. Where is this story going to go and how could it be that much different than H2O? Is it going to be her again damaged in dealing with years of trying to sort of run away from this thing and then she has to confront him ultimately because that moment's already come and gone. We had that moment in H2O. Were they for, were they, do you, I don't know if you remember seeing H2O for the first time. And, it, I did. And, and you saw Resurrection before you saw H2O, right? I believe, no, it was, was H2O first and then Resurrection. And then Resurrection. Okay, well, the, the moment in H2O where they both see each other at the door for the first time in that window. Yeah. I, I was at a press screening for that in Chicago in this massive theater. I've never been in a theater this big. And it was packed wall to wall. It was a real event when this movie came out, and this was for a press screening. So usually press is relatively subdued because they're all sitting scribbling notes and things. But this, that moment, she drops her keys, she stands up and looks, and they, there they are face to face for the first time in 20 years. The entire place erupted into applause and like hoots and hollers. It, it gave me goosebumps, and it still does to even think about because it was such a moment for her to be returning and then and the whole movie's building is is she going to finally be next to him like is, what is this going to be and that finally happens so what can they do in this movie that what can they do <laughs> we've had our moment well, we've had that I was already. I was hoping since you um worked closely with the Akkad family on a couple of projects um that maybe you knew anything about do you know anything about Resurrection? Because people keep saying that um, Resurrection is a forced film. Do you know anything about the pre-production or anything like that? What do you mean? Well, they say that um, he. They want to say that Mustafa, you know, rest his soul. That he just forced it out there, you know, just to get cash. And and I keep telling everyone, I'm like, no, he was planning it from day one. So was he actually planning it? Because Chris Durand, who played Michael in H2O, said that they were already planning another film. Do you know Do you know anything about well, that? Well, they were planning another film because it was written into the contract that Jamie Lee had to come back. Okay. So I, I so would, that... Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you for... You guys, you hear that? Okay, it was already planned. It wasn't a forced movie. It was, they were already going to do it, so... Thank you so much. And the ending, well, of course, and, he, and the ending, H2O set that up perfectly. There was no, I mean, it. nothing's definitive in the world of Halloween, as we've found. And with this new film, it's the same situation where who knows what they're going to do next. They could just start over from point A again. I really don't, I don't know. But H2O perfectly set up Resurrection as well. And uh, I think that I, I, I don't know... From what Jamie Lee has said, that she wasn't super thrilled about having to come back and, and finish things up in that second film, or in Resurrection, but um, I know that it was definitely planned. Okay, so I just wanted to clear that up, and my, my next question for you is, who would you like to portray Michael in this new film, and why? Oh, man. 
there are so many great stunt performers out there who who know their stuff. I mean, I know people even personally who like the, the every time. Okay, I have a buddy of mine, Lito Valesco is his name, and he is who I would hire to play Michael at events. So anytime I had a convention or a screening event or a charity event, he was always the guy that I brought in to play him. And he still does. You can see, you can find him. Oh man, what's it called? Like the Shape of Love or something? It's he and his wife do a bunch of cosplaying stuff. But he does a every year. He does Michael Myers in South Pasadena, and that stems back to 2000 and I think 12. I think that was the year. I believe that was it. It was either 12 or 13, and we had a screening in South Pasadena, in on Halloween night of the original Halloween, and I brought him in to do that. And so afterwards, we just started wandering the streets as, as people were trick-or-treating and stuff, and Michael Myers walking around was perfect. And we've done photo ops and anything. Anyway, Lido gets it 100%. Uh, the only thing is, is he's not real tall. Yeah. I, don't know what they're, I don't know what they're looking for in Michael. I know that the initially he wasn't this big hulking thing anyway. So I don't know. I think if, if, if I had to pick someone that I knew to play him, it would be Lido. Because he is, he has it down to a T, and he's extremely passionate. He's he was in another film called All Through the House, where he plays this killer Santa, and he's done some other stuff. But outside of that, man, it's game on for anybody. I don't know. I would love to see a, a fresh take on him. Honestly, we've seen Michael two different ways, maybe three, if you want to think about like when he the transition from because he's very similar in parts one and two. Yeah. And then four through six, he's different. Like so, that would be the second version of him. And then I think that in H two O and Resurrection, they were trying to go back to the original. And then in Rob's movies, obviously, it's a much more violent version of him. So I guess that there's probably been three versions of Michael. Out of those three, I, w I mean, we've had that already. So maybe there's a new way to approach him. I don't I know. I actually, I'm if sorry, it, to interrupt, but I just want to say real quickly that I, you talked about. South Pasadena. I actually saw Michael Myers. Brian Andrews actually organized something where he got Michael Myers to come and look at me through the camera, and they um they posted it on Facebook uh, back nice. in 2014. So Brian Brian cool. said hi to me, and then Michael Myers walked up and you know looked at me through the camera. So I I, I <laughs> couldn't be there, but they you know. They wanted to share a piece of Haddonfield with me, and so um, I thought that was very cool. Where, who would you like to have play Michael? Do you have someone that you would I choose? do. I just don't want to sound weird by naming this guy. Uh, it's actually no, it's okay. Julian McMahon from Charmed. I'm sorry. I'm laughing right now. Julian McMahon, the guy that played Cole Turner. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I know, I know. I, I No, I could say, sure, sure. I mean, but that's the thing. Like, anyone, you never know what they could bring into it. And the mannerisms of Myers and the concept of the character are pretty well defined. So if you want to have the same thing again, there's plenty of source material that you can bank off of. But it needs to be someone who can communicate without saying anything. And that's not something that a lot of actors can do, to be honest with you. And I think that's something that has been done very well throughout the series. I, I first him. saw Julian in 2002, I think it was, because I, I wasn't watching Charmed in the canonical sense. I was, you know, mm. I would see one episode and then watch another and then watch another. I didn't really watch it straight through until about 2002 going into 2003. So when I saw Julian, I, I thought to myself... I said, man, this guy is great. I would love him as Michael Myers, but um, that, that's probably never going to happen. I like Charmed. That was a it good really show. It really was. Uh, my next question for you is, what are your thoughts on Jamie Lee's return? I mean, are you friends with her, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? Because I know you're friends with a lot of these other guys like John and Rob. I still don't get the Rob thing, but, you know, that's okay. But are, are you friends with Jamie Lee? Not really friends, no. We the the one time that we've been in the same room together was for the 
charity event that we did back in 2011, I want to say. And she was great. She was very gracious. And we hung out backstage and talked before the, the whole uh, ceremony that we had. And she and I were both speaking at it, of course. And she was the award recipient. She was very gracious and hilarious and wonderful. So I, I don't know her. My thoughts on her coming back, I mean, she's an integral part of this franchise. She and I would say she and Danielle Harris are the two most important actors actresses in relation to this whole thing and for her to come back for a lot of people I know really raised the bar not just in anticipation and excitement but also expectation but again I don't like I was saying earlier I don't know what they can really do that hasn't been done I don't know what kind of moment they can give us between her and Michael at this point I don't know I mean I'm yeah it's I'm fine with her being there. I'm ex- I'm excited to see where they go with it. Of course, I'll be there opening day, but I just don't. I don't I've know. often Remains I've often thro- uh, thrown out a theory uh, on my channel, and I call it the hoax theory. As in, what if this whole thing was just a hoax? What if it was really H nine? And you know, they're all just playing with you. They're all just busting your. You know what? Uh, you mm-hmm. know, about this whole thing. And it's like, surprise, we got you. She's, she was really alive the whole time, you know? I mean, yeah. do, you, do you think that's possible at all? No? no. Okay. All right. I, I, I don't. And, and I, I think the reason why is because what they're, what they're doing with this film is they need to, just like they've tried to do with Resurrection and H2O, they're trying to appeal to the widest audience possible. Mm-hmm. And if you go in and you present a film that that isn't, I mean, it, because this franchise has been all over the place, as yeah. you know, it's not it's not like Saw, where it's a a cohesive story throughout each one of the entries, and it all is one big story arc, or like I don't know, even to an extent, Friday the Thirteenth, which each one can be taken on its own as entries and they can certainly be enjoyed on their own but ultimately it's part of a larger story of this thing whereas Halloween has been so crazy it's like the Chainsaw Massacre thing where it's just each time they come out with one or two new movies it's on a different path and there really isn't I don't so uh, it needs to appeal to a wide audience without assuming that they have seen everything that came before and not making it essential that people had seen what came before so what what film do most people know they know the original that's why i think it makes sense for them to pick up after that one if they're doing a sequel here in their eyes it would seem all right this is what people know let's just bank off that let's build off that let's bring jamie lee back let's have john in. let's have john score the thing so it's going to feel very authentic and it gives them what people have been looking for for a long time which is maybe some sort of conclusion to what began in the original film and ultimately has been left open in every sequel since. Maybe there's going to be some definitive finality here. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. I just don't see... I don't really see how this can work, but I'm trying to be optimistic about the whole thing. Sure. You know, everyone's on Facebook. They're all giving me a hard time and, you know, don't be so angry don't be so negative and i've been getting tons of hate mail on uh youtube from the slurs and i've already discussed that with you with the racial slurs but i've been getting a yeah. ton of those and so uh it's it's pretty rough man. yeah those people are idiots they people you know here's the thing with the internet i was just discussing this with my wife this morning because i get I am I'm passionate about a lot of things in life. I mean, obviously, we're all very we're most complex humans with a lot of interests, and I'm passionate about things like gun control and um, women's rights, and I'm really excited about all that's happening right now with this unmasking of all these monsters in Hollywood who have been preying on women and children for years and things, and I've been criticized by a few people for that. Well, you're not getting political on us, are you? Or... Like, I'm not going to buy into feeling guilty about this or that. And I'm like, look, we all have opinions. 
and we're all absolutely entitled to them. If you don't like what Darnell has to say, tune it out. Unfollow him. Don't watch his, his videos. If, if, if you can't handle the fact that someone has a different view than you on something, step away from it because there's no need for you to look at it. Life is sh sh too short and our time is finite. And for you to waste time going through things that you're never going to be content with existing, then why are you doing it? And I, it's the same way with my channels too. If, if there's something that you're seeing on mine, that if there's too much political stuff or whatever it might be, tune me out. I are you care. doing something? Uh, are you doing a show that involves these kinds of topics? I, I've toyed with that from my podcast, which has been offline for a long time now. I only, I did like seven episodes and then I had computer issues that, that derailed it. And when I come back, I mean, I'm not sure what it's going to look like, but I definitely want to get into these things. I think it would be, that's what I've been considering for a return episode is starting to touch on some of these topics and getting some people on who are, are relevant to the subject matter to share their stories, things like that, because it's really not taken very seriously. Like, you you have guys like Victor Salva, oh boy. who made yes. the, G, the Jeepers Creepers yeah. films, and I don't understand, for, for me, I mean, to each their own, I have, like I was just saying a few minutes ago, we each have our own feelings and opinions, so more power to you. For me, he's a pedophile, and he's a convicted pedophile. He raped a child on camera, he videotaped it so he could enjoy it later, and a court found him guilty of what he had done. He did it. So if you're if you're buying a Blu-ray of his movie, if you're going to the theater to see Jeepers Creepers 3, what I just say to people is just be aware that you are paying for dinner or lunch or a video rental or whatever it might be for this pedophile. You're you're supporting him in his life. So it that that's for me not something that I can separate from the person. I can't just go, "Oh, oh, but I like the movies." When I saw the first Jeepers Creepers, I had no idea about him. And I didn't know about his history. And of course, he's just one of thousands of these Cretans who are out there doing this kind of stuff. But for me and what I believe in, I stand behind what I believe in. And whether it's animal rights, because I'm a lifelong vegetarian, if it's, and, and, I, and I don't get soapboxy about it, but cause that's why you don't see me really posting about a lot of that stuff. But when I do, I mean, well, it's, it's my right I, to I have it. to. I have to admit that I did. I did see it, but I did not go to theaters. I, I, I saw the film on TV. They aired it on Sci-Fi. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, well it got a lot of traction. And when I first saw it too, I was really excited by it. I thought, man, like this is, because I didn't expect it to be a monster movie in the end. I thought it was pretty. Honestly, I thought it was pretty cool, especially for its time when it came out. It was really refreshing. But once I f immediately, like I do, I, I'd like to know as little about a film as I can going into it. And then after I walk out of the theater, I want to know as much as I can about it. And I started reading up on him and immediately realized, like, this guy's a monster. And then as the second one came out and now the third, I'm like, who is, who is giving this guy money? And see, that, Why that, are they that's doing the this? thing. I, I was actually referring to the third one because when it came out, I did speak about it. I was told not to talk about it because of the the controversial nature but then right. it's like after a while and don't get me wrong i i'm not saying go support this guy what i said was and i, I want to clear this up with you because i don't want you to think oh he supports it no what i said was no one's making you go and see the movie i said if you don't want to go see the movie don't go see the movie True. that's that's True. what i yeah. said you know i didn't yeah. say yep. oh well victor's a saint you know I said, don't go see the movie. That'd be like if you said, well, what about Chris Benoit? Well, hey, look, you don't want to watch the match? Don't watch the match. Right. Right. But you can't, but you can't go into it now without the knowledge of, of what he ultimately did. And so it becomes a matter of your, your comfort level with what you're taking in as entertainment. And we all have the right to make that call where that line is, where that divide lies. I... I understand, so if people, if people and I, I applaud you. I'm sorry for interrupting. I, I understand where you're coming from, and this is not something I would do all the time. I was just curious as to the plot line of the, oh, of sure. the film. Oh, sure. That's no, that's I'm why sure. I went and I saw it on Sci-Fi. So, that's that's what it was about. Of course. And I, I appreciate the fact that you want to 
uh, defend these these children and women. And I've spoken to you on Facebook about this because um, not that I'm trying to put you out there, but I've told you that you you, you guys had a, a serial killer where you're from, and this guy was um, taking children. You know, well, I say serial killer right. because I'm I'm assuming that they, they are dead. You know, because they with Johnny, with Johnny Gosh, you're talking. Yes, about. and the other two children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's it's it's it it's a part of Iowa's history, and it's it's a tragic part. There are sort of there are two things that Iowa has had that are, are relatively notorious. It's the Johnny Gosh and the disappearance of these other kids, and then also the in Villisca, Iowa, there were some axe murders. Yeah. Um, I think it was like 1922 or something like that, where this a bunch of people were. And anyway, so both of those became national and international headlines. But so you, growing up, I didn't know about Velisca, but very I was very aware of the Johnny Gosh thing, and I it was so the thought of there being a real boogeyman was very present. And while we're on the sub- growing up here, while we're on the subject of somebody like Michael Myers. Uh, do you think that this is this man? Is this a serial case that we're dealing with, or is this just abduction? What is this? You mean with the Gosh yeah. stuff? Yeah. Johnny Gosh. I really don't know because there's so much. There's so many horrible things that happen with kids who are kidnapped, and it, this still happens. Does we it get really? Alerts. Oh my God, we get relatively frequent alerts here throughout the year. Just a couple years ago, there were two girls. In a, in a town near here who went riding on their bikes and they never and they've never been seen since and then there you hear about people who will report there's a van that pulled up and tried to talk this kid into getting into it or people there was someone just posted the other day online in Cedar Rapids here where where I am where they were loading their groceries into their car and they put their child on one side and as they were loading in the other side someone walked up opened the passenger side door and was trying to get their kid out of their car while they were loading groceries into the trunk wow and when when they turned the corner they're like what what are you doing they ran and they hopped into a van and they took off like what <laughs> even the restaurant that my i mean and this makes iowa sound bad but it's is everywhere i mean there are this is no different than the harvey weinsteins of the world and these other creatures who just prey on people but my wife uh, was his manager at a restaurant and there was a, a young girl who would be like high school age who worked there part-time and she was out front waiting to for her ride to pick her up and this guy comes by in a truck and tries to like basically force talk her into getting in the truck with him and then he turns around and comes back and then he starts trying to entice her again to, to get into his truck with him and starts saying all these horrible disgusting things to her to this like kid it's like this stuff is this stuff is everywhere man it's everywhere and it's and i'm, I'm sorry because I, I know it's very painful for you because you told me when we when we talked on facebook because i asked you about the case for research for my youtube video and that that video was never made by the way i couldn't get the assistance that, that i needed but I asked you about it and you said, and I quote, you said they asked me to do a, I think you said they asked you to do a segment on it, but you said I declined because it felt too dark. What do you mean? I had, I was approached by a a filmmaker years ago. This would have been maybe around 2009 or so, 2008, to be, to come in as a co-director, to be a part of a documentary on Johnny Gosh on that case and to because this guy felt that he had some new evidence on it and or some you know some new take on what had happened and it's an Iowa filmmaker and so it was wanting to re-approach this subject matter and I I just felt I didn't I for me I didn't see the worth in being a part of the project and the subject matter is when I say too dark I love entertainment I love the monsters and the things that you see in movies and part of that is the love for how they're created and a, a perpetual fascination with the world of effects and 
makeup and stunts and all these things that make this magic happen. So watching a movie is very different than real life. The stuff in real life is, is a very upsetting to me. And that's why I take up the cause of people who have been abused. And the nonprofit that I co-founded was trying to help homeless youth and kids who had been abandoned by families or who had lost their parents to tragedy. Because in real life, there's, there's nothing to me, there's nothing entertaining about that side of things. There is just, for me, it just represents our need as a society to, to motivate ourselves into action to do things to stop it and to combat it combat all these hor horrific things so to get involved with the documentary you got to think about this like when you watch a movie it, whether it's a documentary or narrative whatever you're spending maybe let's say an hour and a half with it as an audience member the people who are making it especially the directors and producers who are involved with it spend years with them so imagine every day of your life or every few days or however long it may be dedicated to pouring over the facts on case where these children are abducted and maybe murdered and their families are still grieving with open hearts all you know this puzzle piece that's eternally missing in their lives imagine making that your your world for a year or however long and then maybe doing film festivals and going and talking about it to audiences then for who knows how long afterwards it just it's not something that i'm interested in being a part of it's it's it just isn't i mean more power to those who want to do that and i'm glad that there are documentaries and things that help shed light on these things, absolutely. It's just not my, tr it's just my choice not to be involved with, with those. Well, I, I just want to say, um, I'm, I'm really sorry about that stuff, you know, and I understand why you wouldn't want to be a part of it, and I can understand, you know, because I, I never had it explained to me like that before, thank you. I didn't know that that's the way it worked and everything, so now that you say that i don't think i'd want to be either well movies are the same way that we think about how many years john carpenter's been had been forced to talk about halloween 1978 since 1978 he's been asked over and over and over again and a lot of times the same questions about one movie now, obviously he's done so much else and he's been interviewed about all of it but ultimately, he's spending his life with this film, where as an audience, we just revisit it once in a while. It may be a whatever. So the people who are creating these things, it really does become integrated into their lives in a big way. And so you're making a commitment to involving whatever topic you're, you're creating something involving, you're making a commitment to spending your life with it. And if you choose to write about serial killers or make films about murder and things like that or if you want to make fantasy entertainment I mean that's a choice that you that you have to make and there are some amazing documentary filmmakers out there Amy Berg who made this there's a film um, she, she's had two very important documentaries that have come out in the last few years here one of them is called Prophets Prey which is about this uh, FLDS sect of, of the yeah. Mormon religion who the, who these people are like child rapists and uh, abusive and they manipulate the lives of these families and they are they're even murderers it's horrific but she made a very important documentary on them called prophets pray that's streaming on on showtime and she also made one that was called an uh, an open the an open secret that's about this, these pedophilia rings within hollywood where these big time producers like Brian Singer, who did the first two X-Men movies, he's really deeply involved in this world of getting these young boys to come out to Hollywood, enticing them with promises of these, you know, glittering Wait a minute. careers. Wasn't that, wasn't that the guy that, the that, uh, that they said was going to do the Twilight Zone in 2012? What the heck? Was he? It probably was. Yeah, it probably was. He's He's been attached to so much stuff. And, but, but he's directly involved he's one of these guys who are directly involved with this stuff where they bring these boys out 12 13 14 years old and they give them you know they they get them sauced up on drugs and alcohol and they abuse them and sometimes for many years and they guilt them and shame them into not telling their stories but and, and then they, they ultimately just profit off of it and they bring big time investors in these big lecherous creeps who 
show up at these mansions and take advantage of these drunk boys uh, who, who are just trying to find their way in life. I mean, this is a very real thing. And so it's, there, there is an underside to the glamour that people think of in relation to entertainment. And so Amy is someone who's lifting the veil on that. Amy Berg, with her films, she's going into very dangerous territory because the FLDS is a very powerful entity in the Mormon world. I guess they're kind of ostracized, but ultimately they still have a lot of followers. And the uh, and this stuff is still like Brian Singer is still making movies. He's still attached as producer on a bunch of stuff, and it's just amazing that these things are still existing. But it's under the surface. So like rats in the sewers under Hollywood, these people, but they're still there, and the system protects them. So that's why I'm so excited for this current movement to unearth these people and hopefully bring some of them to justice, at the very least destroy their careers, because in my mind, they don't deserve to have them. I guess there was a lot I didn't know about Hollywood. I mean, I, I've always known that it was dark, but just not this dark. And I guess on a lighter note, I'll ask you, some people say that this will be the last Halloween. Uh, do you think it'll be the last one? No. I don't think that that can ever be said. How many times have they said... They even titled, like, a Friday the 13th film, The Final Friday. At the end of Resurrection, I mean, they're, they're, or H2O, they're, it could go either way at the end of any of these films. And so I don't think, as, as long as these... As long as there's public interest in it, and as long as there's money to be made, they're not going to stop. There, there wouldn't be any reason for them that, to stop making these movies. Getting people to agree on the course is the challenge. And that now that the Weinsteins are out of the picture, I think that it'll be a lot easier for them to navigate making more that's movies. That's the same movies. thing that I said. And, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. It just sounds like you're not really a big fan of them and if you'd rather not answer that you don't have to answer that because i don't want to i'm a huge no i'm a huge fan no 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 i meant I, of, the, uh, of got... the weinstein company oh no i'm not a, i don't have i mean i'm appreciative of the fact that they they were behind bringing halloween back with halloween mm -hmm. six because if because if it wouldn't have been for that investment and them picking up that brand, it would probably still be sitting floundering. I mean, who knows? Someone else could have picked it up in the interim. But after Halloween 5, things were dormant for or, uh, quite a while. And there just wasn't as much interest in it. And at, and at the end of, after the reception of Part 5, and it was a time when horror was in a downturn. So the, the future was very uncertain. I think it was much more uncertain then than it is now for what would happen with the franchise. So I acknowledge what the Weinsteins did with films like Scream and I Know What You Did Last Summer and H2O and Halloween 6 and these things. Like they were clearly investing in the genre. So I have respect for them on that front. But beyond that, in terms of their business practices, I mean, all the things that have come to light recently, obviously are horrific, but just in general, I think that they were a big part of I think that there was a lot of complicated issues behind the scenes that made it challenging for films to continue coming out with the Halloween franchise. And now that they're out of the picture, I, I'm going to imagine that those speed bumps will have been smoothed over. And so how long does Blumhouse have it? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know if it's... I, I really All right. No well, idea. My, my next question is, have you ever thought about pitching the Halloween film to Malik because I know he was a friend of yours for a while so have you ever thought have you ever thought about going to, into his office and saying you know Malik I had this great idea you know I just want to throw it out there does that does that go on at Trankus are you allowed to do that you know that's really funny that you asked that because the answer oh, is okay. no and he, he, he and he even asked me one night we were driving it was after some event I don't remember what it was but we were driving and he asked me, he's like, you, you've never, you've never thrown a pitch my way. Like, why haven't you ever pitched anything? And I was like, I just, I don't know. My head isn't there. My head is in the business side and, and all that we're involved with. And the charity was a huge part of that relationship. So that's where my head and heart are right now. And 
I and so I, he's like, well, I mean, he, he was open to it for sure. He's like, well, if you ever do, and I'm like, cool. But for me, it just that wasn't why I got involved. What I, the, the reason I got involved initially, really, the, the the genesis for that relationship, a lot of that was based on this charity that we put to put together, and that grew into a greater business relationship, and that. Um, I just, I, my perspective on being involved with the franchise was I wanted there to be more interaction with the fans and I wanted there to be more transparency with it. So people were more connected because people love this franchise in a way that's rare in film. And I don't think that historically it had been served very well. I think that there had been a real distance between the audience and the people who were making the movies. And I think that it had been underexplored even in print and certainly in documentary circles and things like that. There was just a lot of opportunity to open up the gates to the fans to make Halloween something that was more to them and to help them explore that universe with more depth. That was my perspective coming into working with it. So it wasn't, hey, if I get my foot in the door, maybe I can throw a pitch in and maybe I'll write the next Halloween film. It, it, it was never that at all. I, that never even crossed my mind. And that night when he asked me, I paused for a second. I was like, you know what? I never even thought about this, but it's just not where I'm at. And I never have. I never threw a single idea. I, I think that's very time. humble of you. You know, I, I think that's great. Um, well, there were a lot, there were a lot of, you got to keep in mind too. There are some incredibly talented people who have expanded on the Halloween universe in some amazing ways, like Steph yeah. Hutchinson, who wrote the, the comic books. I, I don't know that anyone is, has written as much about the Halloween world as he has, because he's, he's done so much. And it's in comic book form, so I really encourage people, if you're a Halloween fan, to track down those those comics, because it it's more. It's more, and it's in a way, it's from a true fan. Steph is an absolute devotee of the, of the franchise and a lover of all things Halloween and Michael Myers. And so he came into it with the right heart and what he created was fantastic. So who am I to walk in and say, I have better ideas or I have something that deserves to, to, I don't deserve special audience with a pitch because I didn't feel like it just wasn't where my head was at on anything. But beyond that, there are much greater storytellers involved with this franchise. See, That's what I'm saying. You know, for you to say to me, you know, my head wasn't there. That's one of the most honest answers I've ever heard. Because a lot of people will take advantage of a friendship and they'll say, well, you know, you're my friend, so I'm just going to throw this at you. And you know what? Let's have Michael uh, in Las Vegas. And we're, you know, we're, we're <laughs> friends, so... You you better do what I say, you know. Exactly. Let's put him in space. Let's take let's let's give him a yeah, I mean the, I I I know that's how the business works and I know that people who are pulling favors, that's a big part of it. I I was getting a lot out of that relationship from I the oppor- just the simple opportunities that it was offering me to be a part of this. I was so honored to be in that world and to have my, to have my day to day be discussing this stuff, working with it, promoting it, coming up with new products and things. That was the joy for me. I didn't, I didn't need, there was no ego element with that that said I need to to change the course of any of this. I was just happy to be a part of it. And so I, I'm, that's where my, that's what I got out of it. You are not there now. Is that correct? You are not part of it. Okay. Okay. No, I just, no, I haven't been for I a number I just wanted of to years make now. sure. And I know I said that it would be an hour, but it looks like I do have about four more. Is that okay? Okay. That's fine. Um, yeah, of course. My next question for you is, uh, what kind of films do you hope to make? Because I know you're trying to get into the business, obviously. that That's where this is going, isn't it? No. 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 Not, ul- really? not ultimately. No, I don't really. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a part of it. I'm a part of it. I've, I've, if you, I've really enjoyed, I've ended up on the documentary side of things, making all these documentaries for Blu-ray releases and like, you can't kill the boogeyman that ran before Halloween in 2012. And that side of things is, has been wonderful. So that's where I've spent most of my time within the business and then writing about it too. I've, 
I've long, long before I was involved with anything with any of these production companies or Trankus or anything. I, I was writing for these other these film magazines, and I still love doing that. So I don't have any aspirations to be a filmmaker beyond what I'm doing. If if there's something that pops up, like I there's a Blu-ray coming out in a few weeks on Silent Night Deadly Night, which is a project that. I, that I was heavily involved with and did all the supplementary material on with a great team of people. And that came up, I kind of out of nowhere, I hadn't done anything in a couple of years on the production side of things with a video release. And then those pro- the producers of the Silent Night, Deadly Night reached out saying, hey, our deal with Anchor Bay is up. We need to find a new home for this. And I had worked with them on the theatrical re-release a few years ago, but back in 2013. And they we had a great experience together working together so they called me up and said we don't know where to turn we don't know who else is out there but this anchor bay thing is is done and we need to find a new path and so i helped bring that to the table with scream factory and we got this amazing release put together and it just came up out of nowhere though so it's like i feel like now i'm much more in control of what i'm involved with whereas if you were to go back five years or something, I was saying yes to everything and I was trying to do everything under the sun and I was killing myself because I was overdoing it. None of that was with the end result in mind of like, I want to be a filmmaker. So it was like, I just, I just wanted to do, I just wanted to create and I wanted to help, help elevate the people who had done these things. So like Dwight Little bringing him in for a commentary track, he like bringing him doing the convention thing or, any of the rest of this it's really about lifting up the people who have done this stuff so what about what about more, like a narrator at least or a host or something i could i i could see doing that i could see but i'm open to anything i really am i'm not fixated on my own success as much as being involved with things that i am passionate about and that i care about and things that feel important well, to me and every article I've written has been about something that I love and I'm passionate about. And every Blu-ray that I've been involved with is a movie that I adore. So I've been very fortunate in all of that. I don't, I don't, I'm not a money guy who just wants to get out and do whatever project comes my way just so I can make a buck. It's like, well, I'd rather have time between projects and be able to really invest in it in the end in something that is close to my heart. Yeah, it, it does make sense because I'm, I'm getting this this rod serling's type of vibe from you it's like you 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 sort of talk like him no offense but you you sort of sound like him a little bit and um that would be a great honor i I love i mean could you could you possibly see yourself hosting twilight zone would you do a twilight zone special (laughs) of course i would love to yeah i don't i'm open to that and i've been a part of a lot of film festivals over time, and I really enjoy that interaction with audiences and doing, th- I, whether it's presenting on writing or whatever, filmmaking, the process, or whatever, conventions and stuff. It's It's been a lot of fun, so I certainly enjoy it, but again, there's, it, I know it sounds weird, but there is no end goal here, and there's no, there's no grand scheme at play. It's like if something, if something that I can get involved with passionately comes my way then i'll i'll definitely do it and if if i see an opportunity where something can be explored with depth and no one is and it's something that i can make happen then i'm going to want to do that too but there's nothing now this next question is a bit on the dark side like with the the uh material earlier with uh with iowa Mm -hmm. and everything else and the serial killers but i have to ask this because this is a halloween interview and I, I almost feel funny mm-hmm. asking you this because I myself could be considered one, you know, from what happened. I'm not going to go into that, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, the question is, how would you deal with an unhinged fan? Oh, I, I know it's a, boy, even I, I know it's fan. a bit uncomfortable, but I have to do that because this this is popped up on a lot of the Halloween documentaries, you know? Yeah, I know that the people with that have been involved with the films have dealt with some really terrible stuff. And this, again, goes back to these empowered creeps that are out there in this world. I Hearing the word fan, even, like, that, it's just... 
I don't know. I'm, I'm not on that level as someone like a, like any of these folks who are involved with these films. So I, I don't, the, the, I, I can't foresee that happening. If it were to be an issue, I've only had one time where there was something frightening that had happened, and there I was. It, I don't remember what year it would have been. Maybe 2013 again. 2012, something like that. Uh, I was working with Trankus at the time, and some somebody wrote over and over again to me through social media, through a variety of different names, which were all fake, claiming that what what we collectively, we being, I, I suppose, everyone at Trankus and whoever else was involved with the franchise at that time and surely Rob Zombie who everyone likes to throw rocks at they I they, they were saying that, we, that what we were doing was destroying the franchise and that we would pay for what we had done and then it got very specific when there was one there were a couple messages to me that were these long rambling rants about about how important Halloween is and how the people who were involved with it hadn't ever understood its importance in the grander scheme of things and it was bringing biblical references into into play. It was really bizarre and creepy. But it got terrifying when they said, I know that you're going to be at this convention that I was going to be at at the time, but it hadn't been announced yet. They said, your family's going to regret you ever going there. And And so I... I took it very seriously in this day and age of, you you know how this world is yeah. kind of works now, and and I took it very seriously, and so I alerted the the convention staff to it, and they had some extra security around me at the event, keeping it not not you know armed guys standing next to me, but within I within view of me the entire time, wherever I was, if I was at the table or if I was on the the stage doing the Q and A's and things like they were there watching. And nothing ultimately happened, but it was a truly scary thing. So I think that how I would deal with it would be just that. I would, I would, I would absolutely take it seriously, and I would try to report it and make sure that anyone who's related to it would be aware of it. And in order for everyone to be as safe as they can be, if I mean, you're talking truly unhinged, that's that's about as unhinged as it gets to me when they're threatening something like that like that's just straight up terrifying and but someone who has their own opinions or they're pissed about something they're like hey I, don't, I thought you're what you said on that children of the corn commentary was bullshit <laughs> or something I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna come back at them and be like I'm not gonna lash out at them I'm gonna okay I respect your opinion by all means I appreciate you listening and I, I, I see where you're coming from I, I, I would just I, I would show them respect and I would, I would let them know that that I heard their concern. Well. And see, this, this is where this is where I get nervous because I certainly feel a bit of responsibility because of uh, because of that. You know, I almost felt guilty when you told me that because when you told me, I said, you know, is this my fault because I had been doing these videos where I would sometimes yell and scream and, you know, but I was never coming into the franchise with the intent on hurting anyone. If I yelled and screamed, it was because I myself was personally upset about something that somebody said or, you know, on a commentary. Yeah. You're passionate. But so I felt guilty when you told me, I was like, you know, what have I done? You know, I was like, did I did I cause this? Because I've had people watch my videos and then they'd be like, uh, you know what? You're right. And down with, and I hate to say the name, but they were like, oh, down with Trankus and so on. You know, it's like, uh oh, you know. And and well, I think I, I think that you have a strong opinion and you're very passionate about these films and entertainment in general, and you want to share your view, and that you have. There's no reason why you should censor your your feelings about it because you aren't threatening anybody. You're not. There's no danger involved with what you're doing. What you're a passionate discussion or a passionate diatribe about a film or whatever it might be is a lot different than sending specific threats to someone who's involved with whatever it is. And and 
taking things into a very real personal level at that point saying you're saying you hate someone is a lot different than going after them with a gun so but this country in this world we have the right to say what we want and we have platforms which is wonderful like youtube yeah. for you where you can communicate this and you're going to find an audience that sometimes agrees with you and sometimes doesn't and that's part of the beauty of this is that this, it encourages discussion and that's really ultimately what you're doing is you're you're, no one's feelings are really being hurt when you're saying these things that are involved with the movies. That's not the point. The point is for people to talk about it and to share their feelings. And so what you're doing is valuable. And I've always said that since the first time you and I talked, that what, you, what you're doing serves a great purpose. And you may feel weird about it sometimes or feel maybe that was a little too much or maybe I was a little too loud that time or whatever it might be, but ultimately know that your voice is important in this community just like anybody's voice would be important and you're conducting yourself in a way that you're not threatening anybody or anything like that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't get concerned or get hung up on that with yourself. Cause I don't, I just want to clear up. I had nothing to do with the 2013 incident at all. So like if it are, there's anybody out there, do not use my videos as an excuse to go and commit terrorist acts because I do not, advocate acts of terrorism so i just want to put that out there if you will if that's okay with you i don't know what you're even referring like to, i so in I other know. words I, I don't condone threatening people because that's what terrorism is you know you're trying to scare them and intimidate sure. them and i don't condone that when i make these videos so when uh, i've had people right. like i said they they've come and say down with Trankus and they would write this stuff to me you know that, that's not me I don't do that so um well, uh, yeah it's a yeah. it's a scary thing but uh, my next question is you said in, in one of your interviews somebody asked you uh, is there anything scarier than Halloween and Michael Myers and you said that one thing that's scarier then Michael Myers is a world without humanity. What does that mean? That means if when you like we were talking about earlier, there are the the idea of a society where people are losing compassion for each other, and where people walk by someone who's being attacked on the sidewalk or when they don't speak out when they know that someone's been violated yeah. or raped where where they're where they know someone is involved with something that is potentially dangerous and they don't speak up or where they don't extend a hand when you even get into politics and you look at the the two different there are many different sides to every story but there are those who want to take away rights and uh, and the means for people, especially like lower income people or elderly. And then there are people who want to support them. So there are people who don't want to offer health care to everyone, for example. And then there are people who want everyone to be able to go see a doctor when they need to so they can survive. And a world without humanity is a world where this becomes commonplace. And when we have, like what we're dealing with right now in this country is, is a lot of hatred. And that comes from the top, that comes from our president who is, who is uh, an absolute monster. And he stokes the flames hatred. And when you set the bar there, when you have someone who jokes about violating women Someone who once said that he could walk into Times Square and shoot someone and his approval rating wouldn't go down. Someone who mocks the handicapped, yeah. as he did, even on camera. When, when you elect someone like that, it speaks volumes about where our society's at. Because whether he won the popular vote or not, he still ultimately won. And a lot of people still cast a vote for him, knowing all of those things. So to me, just his presence indicates that there's something wrong. And when you go beyond that, when you come from the perspective of working for a charity, for example, and you know how hard it is to get anyone to contribute any money to that, the, but 
people will share a video a million times of someone getting hit in the face with a bowling ball or something. Yeah, that's true. Like, like our we we need to keep our compassion in check. And people who are selectively compassionate about one thing but not another, like oh, I, I don't want to get into the specifics here, but you know what I'm saying is just that like my greatest fear is that we continue down a path of division and where people are increasingly isolated and we lose track of what humanity as a whole is really about and what we can mean to each other in favor of usually selfish reasons and and that results in these horrible atrocities like you see like you're talking about Johnny Gosh and these terrorist acts in Las Vegas and the shooting and things like that like these are things that are born out of lack of humanity that's infinitely more terrifying to me than a fictional character in a movie who you know through this this story that has played out like in the in the Halloween franchise yeah it, it really does and I just want to say really quickly before we get to the next question the reason why I was so obsessed with a case if you allow me to speak on it really quickly with Johnny no, is show. because first it was Johnny and then I said okay well that's bad but it's like as I kept watching the YouTube videos then I hear about another another kid in 1984 I think it was and then they're telling me about another kid in 1986 and I'm like excuse the expression but what the hell is going on you, right. you know I mean yeah. you're, you're telling me that three kids and you don't know anything and so right. the the part that disturbed me Justin was when the kid asked for a slice of pizza that really that really pissed me off excuse the expression but it really did he said, Mom, uh, I'm going to be home soon, so save me a slice of pizza. I forgot his name, but that's that's one of the last things he said to his mom in Iowa. And then, just like that, he was gone. She said she saw him go down the, down the street, turn the corner, and just like that, in the snap of a finger. That's it. That's... That's nightmarish. And as a parent, I, there's no greater fear in this world than something happening to your to your child. And I understand that it's it's so frustrating when you have situations like those cases that you wish that they could dig into again, that reopen it, get these get more resources poured into it to try to figure out what exactly occurred. It's like it's like as we move farther away from things somehow they become less important there are so many crimes for a variety of reasons whether it's cultural or where you know where people live so socio-economical that are swept under the rug and never really dealt with and never addressed and it's heartbreaking to consider that because at the center of it all is a human being or human yeah. beings and how do how do you turn your back on that how do you walk away from that conversation that kid had with his mom but like like i mentioned those two little girls who disappeared from here a couple years ago they just went out that summer to ride their bikes what what were their last conversations with their parents i mean you don't think it was so it's you don't think it was that same guy though i mean he couldn't have been right i mean he's he's well he would they would have to be so old by now i can't imagine people always talk about that with things like the zodiac and things like the zodiac could be like 90 years old at this point probably so he the odds are really against if, if that person's still alive them acting on any of that but it's an illustration of the fact that while we can look back at johnny gosh and, the, and those kids and we can say good lord i wish we could figure this out well there's a lot of it happening today too in fact there's probably more happening today i don't know that that we're that can that we can deal with but until we're until we confront the issues behind a lot of this and until we dedicate ourselves to pouring the appropriate resources into conquering and addressing this stuff that's where the problem lies like we're the we're breeding a lot of this i think and this goes on to these mass shootings and things like that like we're the only country in the world where this happens yeah we're the only country in the world with so many active serial killers all the time and so many 
and this in this great history of all these unsolved crimes and things like we have a lot of work and and a lot of people when they when they see this interview they're you know because you're you're always going to have some smart alex say well what the you know what in the f does this have to do with halloween and you know look uh this stuff you know had to be brought up because obviously as you said in that interview that you did in iowa there's a a much more real terror uh out there than michael myers so that's what it has to do with halloween for anybody that's gonna ask that question you know so um it's an unfortunate thing but um my my next question, and this is the controversial one that I warned you about on Facebook. Some fans, including myself, feel that John, and I hate to say this because I know you're friends with him, but we feel that John doesn't doesn't really care about the the fans or Halloween. What what are your honest thoughts on that? If you even want to answer the question, if not, I completely understand. No, no, I'm happy to answer it. I'm certainly not going to speak for mm-hmm. him. But what I, what I can say is through through is based off of years of interaction with him and seeing him interact with others about it. Like I mentioned earlier, he has been talking about this film and these films for decades. And see, and a lot of what he's been asked about it is kind of repetitive. Yeah. Sure. Oh, so I see. And so if it if it comes off, if any of his interviews come off as insincere or something like that well how many times can you be asked like what was the origin of michael myers <laughs> or why did you why is this set in illinois or like well, the, the mask oh it's william shatner huh how about that how how many times can these discussions be had so i feel bad for these guys and like what we talked about earlier too that you're tethered to something you create for the rest yeah. of your life after you've created it and i think if anything especially with recent not just his involvement with the new film but he just put out this new album where he's going back and doing new versions of a lot of his famous themes from his historical films including halloween he's not turned his back on these movies at all over the years he was asked time and again to return to the franchise to be a part of it but he never saw the worth and what he told me once was he's like it's a lose-lose scenario I can't walk in. If I were to walk in and direct a Halloween film today, it would only be viewed as a far cry from what the original was. He said this, it's going to be impossible to overcome that. And I get that because he's been there and he's done it. But at the same time, he has always remained open to fans for interviews and, or you know different media outlets. And when he does conventions, he answers questions about it just, to, just like it was made yesterday. So he's an older guy who's been who's had a a career that is had its challenges because of the lack like we were talking about it the beginning of the interview here he has been viewed as a bit of a risk by the system i guess you could say and so he what the opportunities that are afforded guys like james wan and some of these big um wes craven and some of these others they just it's been different for john and so and at this point in his life at his age he's he's very interested much more interested in in being a part of some artistic projects like he's been trying to get this movie dark child off the ground forever and he's doing this comic book series he's back into doing music with his son and and all of that is very very it's become a real passion point for him clearly as he's touring with it and releasing albums he's a rock star now man at his age he's so his his head's in a different place, but he, I will maintain that he has never turned his back on the franchise or the fans, and he has never, never slighted the importance of this or had anything negative to say about the legacy of the movies or the importance of, of what he contributed to it. Not that I've ever seen or heard. I, I want to thank you for clearing that up, and I, I'm not trying to plug myself, but I, I want to say that I've always wanted to do one, you know. And it's it's really messed up because you have a lot of people that don't want to do these films, and then so when you have somebody that does, it's like I don't know. I I just I really wish I could sort of put my feet in the pool and get them wet, so to speak. You know what I mean? 
in terms well, of I making would, a movie would, or talking with him? Well, both. I would love to do a Halloween film. And by the way, I just want to say I don't look at John as a risk. I would love to speak with John. I would love to get him on here. I would love to see John on TV. If I were an owner of some kind of TV station or a company or whatever, he wouldn't be a risk to me. I think he would be a tremendous asset. I would love to have him. Despite my views well, on him, I would love it. Well, and he, I think, again, the media as a whole is much more open to him now than ever before. And his contributions to film to film and to music are are acknowledged now so it's a very different scenario but the studios are still not throwing money at him they're still not looking at him and saying hey you know the the last like five films you've made have have not made money but we want to give you 20 20 million dollars to do this like where he is embraced and where he has stepped back into the game again here is with halloween so i think that speaks volumes in reference to your question that that kind of tells you what you it need to does. know. Is that he's coming on board and he's not just collecting a paycheck, which he does on every one of these movies anyway. He could just be sitting back and doing nothing on this new film. But he's on board not just to be an engaged producer, he's also composing the music for it, which he hasn't done and, for a long time. So Yeah, and they they he's actually said that if they want a new score, he's open and if they want a new theme, he's open to that. And I really hope it doesn't come to that because I need the the Halloween theme, you know. I, I can't. Yeah, well, I'm sure that'll be a part of it. I can't. Yeah, I, I definitely well. can't see that happening. I have one more question for you, mm -hmm. and I want to say that uh, you've cleared up a lot of things about yourself and about the business and about John. So, sure. Um, you know, if what you say is true, and I believe it is, I, then I, you know, and as hard as it is for me to do this. I apologize to Mr. Carpenter. I had it wrong. I did not know. You know, I didn't know that he was being pummeled like this with all these questions for the last 30 years, you know. Well, I'm not saying pummeled. I'm not saying that he would even view it that way. I'm just put, trying to put myself in that perspective of someone who, you, when you create something out of the gates that is that iconic and stands that towering over a genre as Halloween, it's going to follow you. And it's going to be the thing that people ask you about the most. I don't think he's getting many interview requests for Ghosts of Mars. And that's not to slight Ghost of Mars, because I'm sure a lot of people love that movie. But Halloween is where he made his mark. And so he has spent years, and, I, and you see it at conventions, or even reading interviews. There's, I've, I've watched interviews that have been done with him that are like on YouTube, for example. And you just some of them you just wince because the questions are so painful and so, and you just think about my god he's he, you know here's someone who's having to address these same things again and answer the same questions again so i'm not saying that he views any of it as i'm sick of sick and tired of talking about that not at all because clearly he's still willing to talk about it which is great i just thinking about being in that from that perspective it it certainly could be something that over time you might lose a little bit of juice in terms of the enthusiasm when answering the same question the 2000th yeah. time. And I, mm -hmm. I, I understand that because I did speak to him once. Uh, I said, John, I said, Mr. Carpenter. And he replied, what? I was like, uh oh, you know, so um, I, I guess it's from all those Halloween questions, you know, because he told me he came on Facebook to answer some questions. So when I called his name, called out to him, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I think he was kind of exhausted and, uh, I want to. That may have been the case. He's an yeah. older guy. I mean, you got to keep that. Thank in mind. you again for clearing that up because I, I had no idea, and even I would get annoyed. You know, like when you mentioned what's the origin of Michael Myers, that had me cracking up. Sorry for laughing in your ear, but well, no, it's that, intended. That had Think me about that, cracking though. up. Yeah. But uh, here's the final question: mm -hmm. If there could only be one more Halloween movie. Who should the producers select? Why and what should the movie be about? Who should they who, who, should, who should they select to make this film? Why should they select them and oh what my. should the film be about? Hmm. 
I think that the easy answer would be for Carpenter to, to seal the deal on it, for him to bring everything home and to have a chance to do it. But as he acknowledged, the, it's like I can't, this, that's not going to be a winning proposition. So um, I think that that would be the most obvious answer to that. Outside of that, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I honestly, I don't know of anyone outside of him that I would just immediately point the finger to and say, hey, this is the one for the job. I think maybe if we had to look back at the history of the franchise, I think that having Dwight Little do another one could be yeah, really I think interesting. That would be great. Because, yeah, he's, his part four is so revered and from the, from the outset everyone really embraced that movie in a big way and that was another big moment like h2o where it was the big return of michael myers and it was celebrated in a big way and how he handled that film i think a lot of people really respect so i think it would either be john or dwight little i would point to have you spoken to rick rick rosenthal yeah yeah we've done a few things how's together he how's he doing we, I, He's, I, last I saw him was a few years ago, we did a, I hosted a screening of Halloween 2 in 35 millimeter in, in LA and he and his wife came out and they were great. The Q and A was awesome. Gloria Giffords was there. Cliff M Emick, the security guard yeah. in part two, he was there. And yeah, he's, he's passionate about the franchise and obviously he returned in your favorite entry and so he's definitely he's he's a really good guy and when i had to call out to him for some help with a a few things with the charity and his support of that he was right on board immediately for that too so i can't i mean he's just been all my interaction with him i certainly wish i could get him but um on that note justin i want to thank you for being here i don't want to hold you here any longer than you have to be or want to be um I want to thank you so much for doing this interview. I think the fans will love it. And like I said, there are going to be some jerks out there that have something to say and they'll probably flip me off and they'll probably be more slurs and, you know. Let it roll off I'm, you, man. I'm That's all you got to do because just like, yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's unfortunate that, that, that there are people out there who just need to do that to others. It's, it's a real tragedy, but what you're doing is is what you're passionate about, and I'm sure that a lot of those people wish that they could be doing what they're passionate about every day. So, don't even worry about those fools. Thank man. you again, Justin. Thank you so much. You bet. Thanks for having me on.